class, which I'm very excited for. The only downside for that is next week our uh, uh, Thanksgiving and then finals. So that's the only downside. Uh, but, but the semester will be over soon. Then I have like two classes in the spring and then I'm done. Uh, so the, the end is near. There's light at the end of the tunnel. It's filled with finals and that uh, small exam called the bar exam. <laughs> so once those get out of the way, uh, uh, hopefully I'll be done with school forever. I, I've, I've written off school. I'm tired of it. I'll let Leah do the teaching, and, and I'll go and, uh, and, and leave the books behind, hopefully. Enough about me. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. There it is. Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. What is the most pressure-packed situation you could imagine? The World Series just ended. Maybe it's the bottom of the seventh or bottom of the ninth, game seven of the World Series, winning run on third, right, two outs. The count goes to 3-2. Uh, my my uh, childhood baseball hero was Freddie Freeman. He was in a similar situation with a team I don't have to mention uh, <laughs> during the World Series this year. What's that batter feeling in that moment, that, that, that pressure? All that you've worked for, not just this year, but your entire life, comes down to this one pitch. Here's a guy taking the bar exam. It's his last chance to pass after four years of undergraduate work, three years in law school, there's some pressure. Or maybe a boss of a company, they're in financial duress and trouble. They're, he's about to make a presentation to a customer, and if they can just get this contract, the company will be saved. Talk about pressure. And all of us can imagine situations like that, and, and I'm sure we've all been in one ourselves, where it's all on the line where it seems like nothing else could possibly matter, where this is the absolutely most important moment of all time. Maybe it seems so to you in the moment. And what we just read in Revelation 20 crushes any of those. This is it. Because this passage describes the final judgment, the day when all of us, and I mean all of us, stand before God to answer for our deeds done here upon this earth. There will be no higher stakes than that. This is the moment when and where our eternal, eternal destiny is decided. Nothing has mattered like this, and nothing will ever matter like this again. It's the ultimate test, the ultimate exam, the ultimate pass or fail. And maybe we need to rescue this from the classroom, because this isn't talking about whether you pass or failed ninth grade algebra, or whether you did well on a standardized test, as important as those may be, the language of the Bible here, this is a final tribunal. It is courtroom language in which we are looking at the supreme court, giving a verdict that cannot be appealed from and a sentence, a sentence which cannot be escaped from, from an all-knowing and an all-righteous judge. And in this last courtroom, you and me, all of us, will stand before the great judge of all. So what will you say? What will you say on judgment day? In this pressure-packed moment, how will the judge rule? In your favor or against? And I firmly believe that we know, each of us know, that the day of final justice is coming within our deepest parts of us maybe. Hopefully, hopefully, we long for it because we all want a day to come when those who have done these terrible wrongs face a final judgment for their misdeeds. 
And, and, and we want to know that history's most awful men and women will have to face the consequences of their terrible conduct and, and their terrible actions. But you and I need to know that Judgment Day isn't just about the famous villains of human history. You will be there. I will be there. What then? What will be said of us? And that's exactly where we are this evening. And what I want to do tonight with the time that I've been given is to give you four things that some may say on Judgment Day that just won't work, that will not suffice, that will not appease the final judge. And then I want to tell you what the Bible says is the one thing you must say. You've got to say you will want to say. Let's, let's talk about what you'll say on Judgment Day. And before we get into that, I'm using some metaphor here. We, we, we don't know exactly what Judgment Day will be like, so if you can follow me in my extended metaphor, hopefully the point will become clear to you. Let's start first and foremost from Psalm 14. I think there's going to be some people on Judgment Day who are going to end up saying to God, who, who exactly are you? Psalm 14 verse 1 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Have you ever been in a situation where you know you're supposed to know somebody and you didn't know them? Uh, and it's just really, really awkward that you don't know them. There's a story told about uh, President Teddy Roosevelt. President Teddy Roosevelt had a sister named Corinne. And Corinne was on a train. And as Corinne sat in her seat waiting for the train to depart, another lady got on that Corinne recognized and, and that Corinne knew from, from earlier life. But it became very apparent early in the conversation that the lady just didn't know exactly who Corinne was. And she was bluffing, right? And you know how you do that, right? Hey, good to see you, uh, pal. <laughs> you know, how's your mom and them? Hoping something will be said in the conversation quickly that will kick your memory into gear so you'll know who it is that you're speaking to. And so this exchange, this awkward exchange is going on. And, and finally, the other lady looked at Corinne and said, well, well so what's your brother up to lately? At which time Corinne said, well, he's, he's still president of the United States. <laughs> it, it, it's a little awkward, isn't it? And, and I think for some people, there they are, there's Corinne. I think for some people, that's going to be the awkwardness on the day of judgment. Because while atheism is, is certainly in the minority, it continues to grow. And, and there's also agnosticism in our society. That's, that's people who necessarily aren't, aren't pure atheists, but, but they're unsure. They, don't, they, they say they don't know the Lord. They don't know God. It's not just these people that would fit in this category. What about people who think they know the Lord, but they have a warped image of who he really is? They really don't have a clue who the true Jehovah God is. What about folks who think God is going to be like their grandpa, right? And, 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 and so maybe they'll look at the Lord and they'll say, what are you doing judging people? <laughs> I don't believe in a God that's going to judge me. Or maybe someone will say, I thought you'd be wearing a teddy bear suit because I, I like to think of God as this fuzzy wuzzy bear and I, I, I just hold him and he makes me feel good. I don't know about all, all this judging business. What are you doing casting people into hell? And there will be people on Judgment Day who don't know God in that way and they have fake images of God and false conceptions of God. And all of those will be utterly done away with those thinkings. Listen to Jesus in John 8. In John 8 and verse 16, Jesus says in John 8 verse 16, Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I am the Father who sent me. Let me add to that what Jesus says in John the 12th chapter. Jesus speaks powerfully of judgment when he says in verse 47, If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. I'm going to sum this up right here by saying something that probably will not be bookmarked as incredibly profound. <laughs> but it's important we restate it. You don't wait until Judgment Day to be introduced to God. You need to know the Lord before you get there. And don't be surprised when you see God on His throne and His Son 
at his right hand. Don't be surprised. Know the Lord now in this life. So there will be no surprises on who God really is on Judgment Day. Maybe right along with that, there will be folks who will come up with this line. You know, somebody's going to say this because people say this thing all the time, right? Well, Joshua, nobody's perfect. You know, when nobody is perfect comes out of people's mouth, they aren't saying it because they're, they're doing the right thing. No, people use this line to cover because somehow they have done the wrong thing, but they don't want to take responsibility for it. So we say things like, like well, I'm only human. I'm not perfect, but you know, who is? Yeah, I, I, I guess I messed that up, but, but you know, nobody's perfect. I'm not sure that's going to really play well on Judgment Day. Because while we talk a lot about standing in front of God, the judge, what else has God done? What other role does he play? What else is going on there? Not only are you standing in front of God, the judge, you're standing in front of God, your creator, the God who made you. And so when you stand up and say, you know what, God, I'm not perfect, What you're saying to the God who made you is you, God, didn't do a very good job of creating me. You've made me defective. You did a poor job of constructing me. I I was unable to do better. And somehow attacking the judge seems like a poor strategy. You didn't make me right. Lord, you just expected too much of us. For someone made the way I was, no chance I could live like you. You didn't make me right. Nobody is perfect. The Bible never says that we were designed and created in some flawed way that we're incapable of obeying the Lord. In fact, uh, Calvinism teaches us that, 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 in fact, we are depraved, and, and we can't obey God. But that's not what the Bible says. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 29, see, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. As soon as you begin to talk about man's personal responsibility and accountability, and that we are capable of obeying God, this starts just jumping off the page everywhere. So, so for example, in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Why does Moses say all this stuff if we can't do it? What's the point of this if if we've if we we've been made to be incapable? In fact, in Acts uh, ten, if you have questions about this, meet Cornelius. In Acts the tenth chapter, we're told about Cornelius. He's he's obeying the Lord. He's doing right. He doesn't know everything about everything, but he's doing good things. Verse one at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, prayed continually to God. In verse 3, Cornelius receives a vision from God. Verse verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. God. The Lord says he's taken note of Cornelius' faithfulness and goodness, and that story goes on. But this business that we're incapable simply goes around Scripture. Maybe th- the thing that ought to be said here is, is why would there be a judgment day anyway if you can just get by by saying, Lord, I'm not perfect. I couldn't have done better. I did my best. Couldn't anybody say that? Adolf Hitler, you stand charged with murdering 12 million people, plunging the world into gigantic conflict that cost millions of lives, did untold amounts of damage. 
nobody's perfect. <laughs> That's not going to wash. That, 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 that doesn't make sense. If you want to put scripture to that, look at the Assyrians. The Assyrians were relentless. They were relentlessly cruel. When they captured a town, the Assyrians would kill people in unspeakable, awful ways. They tortured folk, folks and did all kinds of bad things. They were terrible. You want to see God's verdict on that? Look at Nahum in the Old Testament. Let's have a little bit, a little bit of Nahum chapter 3. This is the book written to denounce Assyria, to hold them accountable for their wrongdoings. In Nahum, the third chapter, verse 18, Your shepherds are asleep, O king of Assyria. Your nobles slumber. Your people are scattered on the mountains with none to gather them. There's no easing your heart. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil. And the book goes on to pronounce judgment. It doesn't say, well, Assyria, you did your best. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. They're held accountable. The king of Assyria is held accountable. Second Corinthians 5, here's another example. Paul says that we must all, verse 5, appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he's done in the body whether good or evil. The very nature of what Paul is talking about demands personal accountability. Biblically and without exception, every time God holds people responsible for their conduct, they are not allowed to slide out by announcing, eh, nobody's perfect. And in some way, in the same way, this line, thirdly, will not work. This is the other side of that, right? You know what? I was pretty good. I was a pretty good person. I did a lot of good stuff. This is the go-to line that most people, I think, expect to deploy on uh, Judgment Day. They're going to say this, and I believe that because it comes up all the time. It, this, the second and the third line here go together well because people say, I'm not perfect, but, you ready for this? I was pretty good. <laughs> I did a pretty good job. I've helped a lot of people. I gave money to charity. I'm kind to puppy dogs. I even try to avoid them in the road. I did a lot of good stuff. If you had a nickel for every time you heard that, you go to a funeral, what do people say? Oh, this person was so good. If they're not in heaven, I don't know how anybody's going to make it. She did so many wonderful things. And while we understand the meaning there, on the day of judgment, some, some people's strategy is to call attention, I think, to their good deeds. And Jesus actually referenced this strategy in Matthew chapter 7, toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Here it is, verse 22. On that day, many, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Didn't I do a lot of good stuff, Lord? Didn't you see what I did? Verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What do we say about this? Let me say something about, you may not have not expected, <laughs> doing good matters. <laughs> doing good stuff does matter. In John 5, this is Jesus again, who says how we live our lives and the kind of lives that we live matters. Verse 28, do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Doing good matters right? When we follow after Christ, it changes how we live, how we treat people. We become uh, uh, other-centered instead of self-centered. Doing good matters. But, and here's the point, doing good is not the basis of our salvation. Doing good is a far cry from somehow deciding that on the day of judgment, it will simply be a matter of bookkeeping. God, look at, God will look in that giant ledger, 
<clears throat> he's going to see all of our good deeds. He's going to see all of our bad deeds. He's going to make his list. He's going to check it twice. Someone's going to say, wait a minute, Joshua. <laughs> Didn't you start the sermon by, by talking about reading about books and books being open? That's Revelation 20. Yes, and Revelation talks about that. But where this idea goes off the rails is that thinking that judgment is nothing more than math. Do you have more black marks or more red marks? Let's add them up and see. And if you got five black marks, that's not good. And maybe you got six good marks, okay, you're in. In fact, if it, it, it doesn't matter if you have a million black marks. As I ain't got a million black marks and, and, and one of the good marks, you're in. <laughs> People think it's math, like it's an equation. And that's a very crass way to put it. But when people say, I'm a good person, what they mean when they say that is, hey, God, you check it out. You check your list. You look in that ledger. You look on the good side. You're going to see I deserve to go to heaven because I did more good stuff than the bad. There's more things in the good column than the bad. I always wonder how many people on Judgment Day are going to say, oh, man, I, I really should have helped a little bit more. I should have helped that old lady across the street one more time, maybe someone in the back of the line saying, hey, I need help, I need a little extra credit for the final exam, right? You know someone will be trying for that. And what about ties? You know, in baseball, a tie goes to the runner. So if you have exactly the same number of good marks and exactly the same number of bad marks, do you get in? What's the rule on that? Maybe I get a dusty corner of heaven, right? It's, it's ridiculous. And it's an extended metaphor, I know, but it's to make a point. It doesn't work at all. Because that's not how salvation is. It's not the nature of salvation, particularly because all this I did good stuff and I was a pretty good person fails to deal with the real problem. What about your sins? What about those things you did wrong? You stand up on judgment day and you say, hey, God, look at my record. Look at all the good things I've done. God's still going to say, well, what about this? What about these sinful things? How about the times you betrayed my son? Well, let me illustrate what I'm talking about. Imagine you were the accountant for a multi-million dollar corporation. And you know what? You're a good person. And you're a good husband. And you're a good father. And you coach your kids' little league team. You give money to charity. You help the old lady get her bags into the car. And you even return a buggy for her. You do a lot of good things. But one day, controlling all that money gets to you at that big corporation, and with a few key strokes, you transfer several million dollars, you embezzle several million dollars, you put that in your own account, and when you get caught and you stand up in front of the judge, you say, well, I'm a good father. Didn't you see me return that lady's cart? All that good stuff doesn't change the fact you broke the law. You broke the law. James talks about the law. In James 2, he says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. So good works are great, and good works are important. But what are you going to do about your sins? How are you going to atone for those? And that's the key, atonement. Yes, we do good works, we live differently as disciples of Jesus. I hope we do. If we don't, that's a different lesson. But we don't do good works to work off the bad or to fix what we've done wrong because we can't atone for our sins. We're not capable of atoning for our own sin. That's why Jesus was sent. In Romans, the third chapter, Paul helps us understand this. For all have sinned, verse 23, and fallen short of the glory of God. Doesn't matter how much good you've done, you've sinned. What are you going to do about that? Thankfully, there's a verse 24. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Propitiation, that's a giant word. It means atonement. It means covering. It means Jesus is the sacrifice for our sins. He's paid the price so that we can be forgiven. He does that. We can't do that. We can't even start to do that. The good we do is a response, but it's not an attempt to work it off. It's a response to the grace and mercy and the love of God. 
You can't work sin off by doing good stuff. It never works. Fourthly, just like somebody saying, you know what, I was a member of the church. I'm going to tell God on Judgment Day, hey, check the church directory. I have been a member of that church for 50 years. I'm in there. I'm a part of the group. I attend services very regularly. I'm a member of the church. So when a whole bunch of church folks goes in, I'll stand in with them, and we'll go in together. People love that kind of thinking, right? Why do people love that? Because people love groups. <laughs> There's power in numbers, like group travel. When I was a junior, I went to Scottsboro High School. That's where I'm from originally. Uh, when, when I was a junior in high school, I got the opportunity to play at the USS Missouri in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. It was the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Of course, my parents graciously volunteered to uh, come along as a chaperone, although I don't think it took much convincing from the band director. It was a wonderful experience. Hawaii was beautiful. I got to be with my friends. My, my parents got to spend some time um, away from at least three of their kids uh, and have a little more peace and quiet. But honestly, I think my parents' favorite part of the trip was that we didn't have to do any planning for it. We didn't have to research hotels. We didn't have to choose what outings we were going to do. We just got to go along. We didn't do any preparatory work. We had to pay, uh, and I had to do a lot of fundraisers. But we went. That's all we had to do. We showed up when we were supposed to show up. We got off the bus when we were told to get off. We got on when we were told to get on. Do what the group's going to do. It was great. It was easy. And maybe some of you have done that too. There, there's European tours. I know there's even tours of, of Israel, the Holy Land. Uh, and, and you can do those kind of tours. People love groups. And I'd say this about the group. A group can help you get to heaven. The Lord's group is called a church. And the church is a bunch of people trying to serve the Lord together, trying to understand the Bible, edifying one another, implementing the Bible in daily life, holding each other accountable. The group will help you get to heaven. The group will pray for you. They'll hold you accountable. They will worship with you. The shepherds will watch for our souls. That's huge. That's huge. And it'll give you a huge leg up. But you need to know something. And that's there's no group plan to heaven. There's no group rate. That's not how it works. If you're still in Romans, turn, just turn back from Romans 3 to chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 6, he will render to the group according to his works. No. He will render to each one according to his works. Standing around the righteous isn't the same, brethren, as being righteous. Standing in a garage doesn't make you a Toyota. And filling a pew doesn't make you a disciple of Jesus the Christ. On the day of judgment, you will stand before the judge alone absolutely solo. It will be about you and what you did and how you lived and what you did in relationship, maybe even to the group, to the church group and many other parts of life. But you can't be saved by standing in a good group. And we could go on uh, on that point. The, the parable of the ten virgins come to mind. It didn't matter that five virgins who were unprepared were with the prepared. They were left out anyway. But going on to my fifth point this evening, somebody's thinking, well, Joshua, there's not a lot left. <laughs> what should I say? What should I say on Judgment Day? Paul's got the answer for you. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. And if you write in your Bible, I, I would underline this passage. Philippians 3, verse 7. For whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any, any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You want to know the answer? <laughs> it's about knowing Jesus. 
you've got to be able to say on judgment day, Lord, judge, I know your son. Did you see it in Philippians 3? Knowing Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, my Lord, verse 8, that I may gain Christ, verse 8, that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, not my own good works, not my own, I'm going to out uh, measure the weight and turn the scales in my favor. No, I want to know him, verse 10. Remember the words of Jesus we read in Matthew 7? Let's look at Matthew 7 again. People are going to stand up and have lots to say about the stuff they did, the good they performed. But Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So what do you say? Brethren, you say, I know your son. I know Jesus. And the question we ask you tonight is, do you know Jesus? Because that's the only answer on Judgment Day. When, when the accuser brings charges against you, you must be able to say, Jesus has atoned for my sins. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I know your son, how he came and died and has saved me. And on Judgment Day, what everybody will want to say, what we must say, I'm with him. I have a mediator. I know him. I'm one of his. I know Jesus. In the passage we began in Revelation 20th chapter, look again at verse 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I know Jesus. Jesus is the reason my name can be in that book. And there will never be a more pressure-packed moment than when you stand in front of God to receive your eternal destiny. And this, and this alone, is the only thing that'll work. Can you say it? I know Jesus. I know your son. Are you ready to say that? Can you leave here tonight prepared, knowing that Jesus will make intercession for you on that day? Because if you aren't, if you don't know him, this may be your last warning. Each day, of course, could be our last. Brethren, if you're subject to the invitation this evening, if you need to be baptized, as Acts 2, verse 38 so instructs, and finally, know Jesus, we would love to baptize you right here and right now. Or maybe, maybe you just need the love and support of your brothers and sister Christ. Maybe it's public confession that you need. Maybe you need to return to knowing the Lord. Maybe you knew him at a time and have forgotten and you've lived your own way trying to make it on your own. Come back. Let the brethren here build you up, edify you as we seek to glorify God and seek God.